Um, okay, so today on the podcast, we've also got with us uh, Sarah McDonald, who is a world championship semi finalist in the 1500 meters and is also a European medalist. And she's going to talk to us about her own experiences with uh, menstrual dysfunction. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Sarah. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me. No problem. So we, we always ask our uh, guests at the moment, because I don't think we can ignore it, but um, how are you during the sort of lockdown? How has it been affecting your training plans? Um, and has this sort of eased a little bit over the past few weeks, or are you still pretty much the same? Uh, things haven't really changed too much. Because I have good days and I have bad days, and I guess the bad days come more frequently towards the end of this like, period. But yeah, it's um, been a lot of time at home. I got a puppy as well, so that's kind of kept me <laughs> kept me a bit more occupied. But training has been tough, and there have been days where I've kind of stopped in the middle of a tempo and been like, "What am I doing?" Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I try and get by. Um, but yeah, it's it's okay. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm the same and I think sometimes it starts off you'd start off Monday and you think right this is great and then by the time like Thursday Friday comes you just think what on earth am I doing like what is the purpose of this but I think the, the wet, nice weather's helped definitely because you just think well I'm getting a tan at least you know that's, that's <laughs> quite a good thing um and Lucy, Lucy's actually just got a puppy so you can have a conversation about that after <laughs> yeah it sounds um, like um, I would almost dread a session, but then afterwards I'd be like, oh, actually, that wasn't so bad. And like, you feel a lot better for doing it. But it's yeah. just the process of leaving the front door that's, that's hard. Yeah. I think you normally train in quite a big group, don't you? Like, uh, you've got quite a lot of support with your coach and groups and things. So that must be tough. Do you have a, like a partner that sometimes helps you on the bike and stuff instead now, or you just have to get on with it on your own? <laughs> yeah. So my partner, I, I banned him from coming on my runs on the bike. <laughs> that I did health in sessions I just because obviously you're in like the bubble of the house that I was like running was no one wants to get away from that and put my headphones in and just like have a bit of escape so he helped me with some sessions and he ran behind me on some hill reps at one point and tried to keep me company but oh. yeah it has been tough and people in the street must think I'm crazy and they like vomit up and down <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, would try and I would strongly advise don't run with the puppy. <laughs> I've learned a hard <laughs> oh, way God. in recent weeks. <laughs> yeah, no, she sniff everything. Oh, I would do my head in. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have you sort of been, managed to sort of stay in touch with your coach and things? Has that been sort of continued as normal, as normal as normal can be, I suppose, during given times? Has that sort of helped you through those uh, tough days, I suppose? Yeah, my coach has been really good. David um, speaks to me every day and we'll just touch base, even if I'm on a rest day, just to see how I am. And um, he, at the start of lockdown, he was like, honestly, don't feel it. You have to do everything I'm setting you. And asked me what I wanted, but I said I wanted the structure still because otherwise I think I'll just crumble. But um, he has actually been really good and just checked in and made sure that everything's okay and also offered like if you ever need to call me and just have a, a rant about the news or whatever then please feel free to do that because I guess I don't have that social interaction that I would normally I don't go to love press see the girl see him she's like well just call me and have a rant about the dog pooing on the sofa or whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great that's, that's sort of what we found from a lot of people they've uh, had ups and down days but Hopefully you sort of come into it through the other side now, I think. So, yeah, that's good. Sarah, can you just give us a bit of a kind of brief background of how you got into the sport? Because I've, I've heard that it was quite an interesting, you could have had an interesting experience in terms of how you got into running in the first place. Yeah, so when I was um, at school, I was actually a figure skater and I basically damaged my hips and needed surgery. So I had part of my IT bands removed either side and... Um, I was on crutches for a while and you kind of let yourself go in that situation, especially when you're at school. So I started running just to get fit again after that when I could walk and run. And that kind of just started the running bug, I guess. And I started running loops around the block. And then um, I went to my local running club and <laughs> ended up doing heptathlon for a while, which I was absolutely appalling at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not good at the shot, but I don't think I broke five meters. So, um, <laughs> I found the 800 was probably the better event for me out of that. So, yeah, no. that's how it all began. 
That's so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how did you get into figure skating? Do you know, I went to someone's part, like, you know, at Christmas, you often have like those mini ice rinks and yeah. someone had like a party and um, I, I could, everyone else was like holding onto the sides and I could just like ice skate. <laughs> <laughs> it was so weird. So yeah, I started then going to lessons, got a coach. And then before you knew it, like I was going every day after school. But the ice rink was quite hard to get to. So my mum would have to pick me up from school, take me to the ferry. My dad would pick me up from the other side of the ferry and take me to the ice rink. Then I'd get changed in the car on the way. <laughs> where where was that with the ferry? Um, from South Shields to North Shields. Oh, wow. That's yeah. amazing. Dedication from parents as well. <laughs> so it was like a yeah. tag team. <laughs> so when was the moment that you thought actually running is probably for me and I'm actually quite good at this? Uh, probably when I was in my first year of sixth form. So probably when I was like 16, 17. Um, uh, well, I wouldn't say I'd realised I was good. I'd say that I enjoyed it. Mm. It wasn't until probably my second year of sixth form that I um, started to like probably excel at the level I was at. And I went to English schools and I think I ran 212 there. And I was like, oh, actually, maybe I am actually got potential here. And then went to Birmingham and then everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because at Birmingham, they've got a really big group, haven't they? So you were training under Bud, weren't you? And Hannah England and things. And I think that's when yeah. things started to take off for you, didn't they? Yeah, I am. Um, I actually didn't know that about Birmingham before I went, but I was going to study medicine. And it was with medicine, it's just like where it gives you an offer, you, you go. And um, I remember my dad researching, speaking to the coaches at Birchville, and I was like, I think she'll be fine at the university. And then, Lo and behold, I remember the first day I was there, I saw Hannah England on a run and I was like, oh, I think I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so no, it, it had a good, good group and it was just a good team environment and like there was someone for everyone in there and a good way of making friends and in when I first got there. Yeah. And talking about kind of university, so you, you've obviously established yourself on the running scene over the past um, kind of couple of years and you've made the world championships, obviously. And how have you managed to kind of excel in your running alongside doing, was it a medical degree that you're, you're studying? Yeah, I am. Um, it was really tough, <laughs> especially I found it harder when I was preclinical. So when it was like lectures back to back for so it was like seven, eight hours of lectures a day and then training before and after. I found that impossible. But when I was on placement and in hospitals and going to the GP practices and stuff, I actually found that was better for running and helped me move on a bit because I used running more as a release then. So after a long day, I um, would go for a run and go to a session and I'd almost enjoy that rather than after a long day of lectures like the last thing you want to do is go to a session and but I found like after a day at a hospital where you'd see difficult things and stuff it was like a good release um yeah but I did find it hard to start with like really hard <laughs> yeah God. So obviously like our podcast is all about breaking down the barriers as I, I told I explained to you a bit earlier. But um so we're talking today with, with you about your, your experience with endometriosis. So firstly, how have you kind of been throughout your career with with talking to your teammates or coach um just about your experiences with not just endometriosis but kind of your menstrual cycle periods in general and how they might affect your training? So as a result of me actually having endometriosis. And the treatment that I decided to go on, I actually haven't had a period since 2011, which is weird. Mm. But um, I, I would say I, I'm happy to talk to like my coach and like, people that ask me, but I'm never one to be openly just tell people if you know what I mean. Like if there's something wrong, then I would say, but I wouldn't just force it upon anyone or whatever. Um, but it. It was hard at first because I felt almost embarrassed about it. But now I think a lot more people talk about it and it's a lot more of a, a thing, I guess. But I came through it at the start when it wasn't that big a thing. If you, <laughs> kind of a weird way of putting it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so how did, um, 
you get diagnosed like how did you realize that you had endometriosis because you, you must have been pretty young then yeah so i actually started having problems probably when i was in sixth form i remember having like terrible period pains like horrific my mum taking me to the doctors and trying a few different things then because at first they just thought it was period pain but i was in agony like terrible pain and they put me on the pill tried to put me on the pill back to back tried different pills um and at the first year of uni i still couldn't cope and it every time i took a, a break off the pill it would just be unbearable and the summer of 2012 which was the end of my first year it was to the point that the pill wouldn't even stop that pain and i remember being at home that summer and my parents would alternate between who slept on the floor next to me because at night it was it would probably be the worst and there was times when they take me to a e they would give me morphine then they would let me go because there wasn't much they could do and i was just waiting at that point for an operation to see a specialist i'd had various um ultrasound scans but they don't really show endometriosis so it's like everything they were testing was coming back clear and it wasn't till i had the surgery in the summer of 2012 that it really got diagnosed yeah and so that was was probably like three years lead up to that point but i saw a really good doctor a gp that had worked with the royal ballet and he kind of had a, a suspicion of that and he sent me to the hospital and said like look i've seen this before in girls and i think this is what the problem is yeah. so I, I think without him i'd still be <laughs> in limbo wow that's amazing you poor thing and was the pain like um day in day out because some people experience just regular pain or, or others just have it around like their premenstrual window and when they're actually menstruating so at first i found it was just around like the period of time and like if you were actually actively bleeding and just a bit before that but then i think because i'd held off on actually trying uh, taking the pill back to back and stuff that it just started coming all the time and it was always in the evening or at night and it was just unbearable and it was like getting me down so much because I wouldn't be able to sleep at night and I think it was putting a lot of strain on my mum and dad because they were so worried about it too yeah. um yeah. but it, it almost felt like it's like just a really extreme period pain like a stabbing pain and it would like the only way of really relieving it would be to put heat on your back and then it would take it away completely. But we tried everything like sticky heat patches, the whole shebang. <laughs> and now are you like completely pain free from it? Like, do you ever get recurrence? Like, obviously, endo presumably had a, a laparoscopy. La laparoscopy. I always get that. I was going to say <laughs> laparoscopy. Laparoscopy. <laughs> yeah. So presumably you had a laparoscopy. Like, um, like has it completely gone because obviously it can come back a little bit sometimes um yes yeah, so i had a laparoscopy and also the doctor at the time suggested that i undo underwent some medical therapy for it as well so ever yes. since then i've had what they call prostate injections and that induces a menopause so you don't have a monthly cycle so that the, the endometriosis doesn't grow back as much mm -hmm. um, but that treatment in itself has come with so many side effects and problems like an increased risk in stress fractures. It's like you get hot flushes, night sweats, everything that you would expect of menopause. I also experienced and that I found it hard to come to terms with. Um, I felt like my body was going through a different time to my head yeah. almost. And I found that mentally very difficult and it was hard for a while like i almost felt depressed because of it um and there are still times now where if i do get stressed about something external then i do start to feel the symptoms come back again or exacerbated okay. but not i've never had it since that it's been that bad okay yeah. honestly sarah it's so brave and like amazing that you're speaking about this and sharing it with people because i'm sure there's so many people out there who are going through the same thing and just haven't spoken about it or wanted to speak about it um also from a performance perspective like i think it's amazing like you and other endometriosis sufferers which we know prevalence is generally around 10 percent of women um like from an exercise perspective um 
you must feel or you must have felt from when you had the surgery that your performance must have seen massive improvements because suddenly you're able to sleep and recover better and you weren't in like gripping pain and also just the knowing that you can go training and suddenly you're not going to have like a really big bad bout of pain must have been nuts yeah i actually i've been surprised like i don't obviously advertise that i've suffered from it but people who have heard from other people that i have it always like reach out and speak to me and like wants to hear like what i've done how i've how i've managed it and stuff and i think it would be better if there was more information around it and people were more aware of it because I think a lot of people are probably suffering in silence thinking it's just horrendous period pain when actually they can have treatment or they can manage it better, but they just don't know how to. Mm. Yeah. So what, what was the process for you when you finally you had that one doctor that kind of thought it might be endometriosis? What was then the process to you have until you had the surgery? So my doctor referred me on to the, uh, a gynecologist in outpatients at the women's hospital here. And, um, he referred me on a quick referral because obviously it was it was it was a hard time like having to cope with that and obviously my parents were at home and <laughs> it was really difficult and he then they then referred me on to just get an ultrasound to make sure it wasn't like a polycystic ovary situation or anything like that i had some blood tests ran and then i think they were very much like, i think we need to do a laparoscopy and have a look now and that would have also ruled out any other potential things yeah. Mm. yeah did you or did you have to obviously when you had the pain you were still training um did you have to sort of manage your training around that pain it was, was the times where you just couldn't train and um like how do you deal with it now if you have an onset of you know you feel something's coming on do you sort of know what to do now a little bit um yeah i'd say there's like medications that now i know that i have to have and i always have with me now because if if it happens you don't want to be in a situation where you've gone to race somewhere in Timbuktu and you don't have anything mm -hmm. um but at the time when it was bad back then it would affect my training and it would affect my sleep I remember in 2012 it was the Olympic trials test event and it was the first time I'd ever made the British trials and I was up all night the night before with it. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> it was like the most exciting time ever in your like, career. And then I, I couldn't even enjoy it. And I think that was difficult. But yeah. you do learn to, to manage it and work out when training is a good idea and when it's not. And when you need to just have a nap in the day, then go for an easy run rather than trot around the track. Yeah. Again, as you say, the, uh, like there is this element of managing it, but you also shouldn't be suffering in silence. Like now, clearly you're providing support for other people, but I hope you feel like there's people out there who are supporting you as well. And like, you almost feel like you need a community where it's just like you can share experiences and, you know, there's so many different endometrial dysfunctions out there or menstrual dysfunctions that people just don't talk about. And I think like, you know one in ten people have endo it's not like you're a rare breed but then there also needs to be more um kind of i don't know yeah like discussion and um support around it yeah it's it's definitely something that needs to be uh, the awareness needs to be increased and i don't ever want people to feel like i felt at the start like not knowing what was going on feeling like you were completely alone so i hope that now people realize that it's a bigger thing and 10 percent of women do have it it's it's a lot mm. and when women make up 50 percent of the world's population like it is a huge <laughs> amount really isn't it and um it, it definitely needs to be made more aware of and like you say you went through that whole diagnosis uh, process and it's a lengthy process if people just knew more about it then it might not take as long yeah. um, and for people you know going through things like yourself especially when trying to manage not only sporting careers but you know any kind of career people might be trying to manage a family at the same time it's all relative um and everybody's got their own sort of difficulties with it so hopefully we can help a little bit with this podcast <laughs> yeah. um, there's a, a publication that's recently come out about uh, dealing with covid for endometriosis sufferers um i'll send it on to you sarah actually because I, I think it's really interesting just 
highlighting that actually obviously at the moment treatment is likely to be limited and the impact of stress and changing routines and that's something we've spoken about quite a lot on our podcast but even dietary elements and how they can all um, interplay to affect people particularly with endo at the moment so I think it, it's so important to like, just continually raise awareness around that and look at how um, people can be proactive and and even just like help identify whether you think you might have it yeah that's definitely more I found it hard through this um crisis I guess I remember I have a monthly injection so that's every 28 days all the time throughout the year and if I'm away I'll just um I'll have to self-inject it um but I went to the hospital for my last injection before this period and she was like well you can't have it anymore I was like what do you mean I can't have it anymore she's like well you'll have to have the three monthly one or you'll just have to stop right now and I was like I can't stop I've had it every month for however long she's like well the hospital's like not having any patients anymore so in the end I had to get some injections from my GP and I just the whole of the time in COVID I've just self-injected at home it's like <laughs> it, but if someone didn't feel confident to do that then they've had to completely change their treatment plan at short notice and I think that would mentally be I, I couldn't have done that especially yeah. when I know what works and I tried the three monthly prep prior and it it didn't work because my body metabolizes it so quickly that two and a half months in I'd start having a relapse yeah. and that was difficult oh so is the what's the injection for Sarah is that the endometriosis or yeah so that's the it's a it's an analog it's a hormone analog analog blocker so it stops me having a monthly cycle so it stops the production of estrogen progesterone and testosterone right yeah. and that's that mental isn't it someone just saying uh no sorry end of <laughs> like, <Yeah>. sorry <laughs> yeah you can't have your medication like that's bizarre that's crazy. yeah so i just went to the gp and i was like you're gonna have to give me enough <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. so you were also sarah you were saying just before we went um live that you were that you had your original um surgery back in 2012 and yeah. you were your doctor and your coach you, and with you you, you planned to have the, sur the second surgery after the Olympics, but obviously now that that's all been cancelled, what's what's the kind of plans around that? Yeah, so I was due to have surgery um, in September after the Olympics. It's just like to see if any had come back to see what the situation was, because it's hard to image that. I've had an MRI scan, but because of the medication that blocks the production of the endometriosis, it's hard to actually know what the state is because the sites aren't active. Um, so the plan was to have surgery but obviously the olympics are now cancelled so everything's kind of shifted so i'm not sure what the plan is now <laughs> probably should try and find out but i think people are quite preoccupied yeah it's, it's a difficult one isn't it because then for you after the olympics you it's the massive year of 2020 when there's three championships isn't there now so there's oh. <laughs> commonwealth games in birmingham which is like sort of your hometown as well so that's going to mean something to you um the world champs in oregon which was like the pinnacle of athletics running and then there's the <laughs> european championship yeah. and you just think oh my god <laughs> yeah, and so. they're all like within two weeks of each other yeah um, yeah <laughs> i think it's uh oh yeah it's mental and like seb Coe was like yeah just crack on i was like oh yeah i'll, I'll just do three marathons should we back to back I don't think that's <laughs> going to work. I, no. See what happens come the third one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like shrunk half a metre. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you, you sort of share your story, you said you don't really speak about it that often, but I think it, it, you have made it known that you've suffered from this endometriosis to a few people. Do you like receive feedback from other perhaps female athletes or just females in general when you, when you do sort of speak about it openly? And is, is that quite positive? Yeah, definitely. I, it always surprises me, actually, and I I never really ex expect to have such good feedback about it, but I think it helps when other people know that they're not alone too, and people, other people go through it, and other people have managed it, and also other people have struggled through it. It's not easy. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, do you think it would be helpful if, you know, more and more females did the same, and would that have helped you sort of when you were going through that process, I suppose? Yeah, definitely. Um, 
is just a situation that you don't want to feel alone through and it's hard to almost bring it up to people and i think it's a lot easier to bring periods and stuff up now than it was before yeah yeah I think you, you having a medical background probably really helps because you like really understand the condition itself so you have an authoritative voice based on that as well as being like a phenomenal athlete so that's really interesting um in terms of like future obviously we just don't know what's going to happen in terms of when races might resume etc but um what are your plans over the next few months in terms of plans around what you can kind of make plans for it's hard to make any plans at the moment but i guess you just have to in my head i always tell myself that you just have to be ready to be five or six weeks away from being ready do you know what I mean? Like you just have to be in a position to be able to be ready in the future. So like you just have to maintain that level of fitness to be able to bounce back and get get on the track and stuff like that. So, yeah, that makes sense. I'm not really sure what races are going to happen, and from what I feel aware of, that races won't happen now until August at the earliest. So yeah. apart from these virtual races, which keep going on. The one K well, I think I just have a wobble halfway right. around if I try to do that. <laughs> Definitely. I just think I'd end up running into my dog again or running into a car or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> Too yeah, much in I've the had zone. To pick the flattest like wind behind me downhill. <laughs> yeah. Just you a straight know. line. <laughs> my wasn't working properly. <laughs> Low roads, like you need to see everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did book. <laughs> so that's that's great Sarah it's, it's really nice to sort of hear your experiences and you know what you've been through is, is amazing that you, you're still performing so well and um, you know we really hope that you're able to get to your Olympics next year and things like that and hopefully things will, will go back to normal and you'll be able to carry on managing things um, did you guys have any other questions or anything Right. Mm. Okay. No, I just think it's really interesting. We we did speak to Ellen Abaka um, yesterday, Sarah, about her experiences, and um, she mentioned just how she only found out about the surgery being an option um, when she went to the Commonwealth Games. And I think um, George, you know the name of the swimmer, Emily Seabom. Yeah, yeah, that she watched and saw her competing and and obviously um, doing really really well. And then she thought, well, she's had the surgery, then therefore you know that's that could be a good option for me. And it's just it's so it's great that like. I think just from the swimmer speaking out about it, Eleanor was able to learn about it. And then obviously with you speaking out about it, who knows who you'll be able to kind of have an impact on. So I think it's just nice that there's a bit of a community and a bit of, well, yeah, just people speaking about it in general. Yeah, I was quite apprehensive before, before the surgery. because I was worried about having a big scar on my tummy, like having all that. And actually you can't, can't see it at all. It's simply like the tiniest, tiniest cut through the belly button and like a line just where your bikini line is so it, it goes so you wouldn't even be able to see it so no one ever notices that i've even had the operation and it's so like discreet that no yeah. one would be able to tell because it's keyhole surgery isn't it yeah yeah it's kind of like they just <laughs> to do it they kind of inflate you a bit so afterwards it's just a bit uncomfortable and you feel like you need to be winded <laughs> yeah <laughs> I can imagine, but it's very clever what they do, isn't it? Through such a tiny incision, I always think. I just think, how can you know what's in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I was amazed actually. And I came yeah. from a medical background. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been great chatting to you. Nice to catch up and things. And um, yeah, I hope you, hope you get your house sold and everything and you get to where you want to go. <laughs> if you need any, anything else, then just let me know. Cool. We will do. Thank Wonderful. you.